January 29th, 1993, Whoopi Goldberg had Grace Slick as a guest on her talk show. Whoopi uh, is more a conversationalist than an interviewer and can't say it's an incredibly engaging conversation, but a very relaxed Grace who's talking very openly. So I enjoyed it. And people that don't like Whoopi now may like Whoopi then. Smile, smile. Kindness. Happy. Not a scrunched up forehead. Because it's on so late, you know? <laughs> oh, we're here. We're here. Grace, we're here. How you doing, baby? We are. We we're are. here. We're here. We're just talking about time slots. Yeah. Who produce, Who's who, who runs this thing? Well, this is all done locally. You know, local stations put me on where they think I ought to be. I'm but talking it's, about who's the guy odd. with the big, you know, with the final say. We have the final say. Then we have put yourself on at 7 o'clock. But they see, we're syndicated. I'm sitting here with Grace Slick. We'll be right with you. We're syndicated. Okay. And because we're syndicated, local stations have the right to put us wherever they want. I hate that. Well, I'm on at, what, 1 a.m. or something? 1. Yeah. Yeah. But you're here now? Yeah, but I can take a nap and stay up and watch you if I want to, but everybody in America can't do that. I said, well, you know, some of these folks in America ain't ready to watch me. <laughs> <laughs> That's no. why you ought to be on earlier. It's true. Well, you write them a letter. They need to get ready. I think so, That's honey, because right. they wasn't ready for you. <laughs> they wasn't ready for you. You know they're not ready for me. Did you ever... Did we care? No, no. obviously not. <laughs> obviously not. And you're still here. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah, uh, now that's prob that's uh, I don't know what that is, but it is uh, one of those things about drug taking drugs, and we're talking about either prescription or the so-called street right, drugs, right. where it's a real crapshoot. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of people are not here. That's right. Who got the crap shot out of them? You uh, know? Yeah. <laughs> well, they shot it out of themselves, but we did. A lot of us didn't know any better. Yeah. I mean, it's like uh, uh, everybody came out with these uh, grandiose stories about this tortured life of this, that, and, you know, come on. Everybody was uh, very young, making a lot of money, having a lot of fun, and what it is is your body can stand this much on that day, yeah. and then it changes. The yeah. body changes all the time. You say, well, I had two of those last week. I think I'll have three. You're dead. It's wild. Yeah. But you it's ain't rough. dead, and that's why you're here. We're here with Grace Slick. You know her probably from the Jefferson Airplane, but you're going to know her better, baby, when we come back. Go on now, see the opening. You know that nice thing I do? Go ahead. This is a good bunch of guys, you know. It's the only action I get, so I'm pleased to have them around, <laughs> you know. But I w let's talk a little bit about the Jefferson Airplane. Okay. That was quite a period. That if I can remember. <laughs> Were you out of it a lot? Uh, no, I just don't have a very good long-term memory. Short-term memory, yeah, it's great. But right. long-term, nah. So it's like, uh, particularly now, since what I've been doing for the last three years is studying the history of biomedical research procedures which is, you know, another planet. Oh, my gosh. And uh, so when I think about this stuff, it's, it's as if somebody else did it. Really? Yeah, it's like another person almost. The, I think for me, at the Fillmore and various places, I mean, what, <laughs> that must have been like quite a scene to walk in and have your band and, you know, Joe Cocker or 
Country Joe and the Fish? Or? Yeah, but you don't think about it at the time. I mean, like you are admired among people I know, probably m almost more than anybody else. But you don't sit around and think about that. You don't think, you know, you don't sit around and think, "Wow, yeah. I'm really huge. I'm a monster. I mean, I'm a big deal." Do these people realize what a big deal I am? Do they know I'm going to go down in history? I mean, you know, you don't. Yeah. No. Sometimes I do. Sometimes. You know, yeah. but not often. But I mean, you really loom large in everybody's legendary thoughts. Well, I'm following after you. <laughs> I'm following after you. I mean, White Rabbit, you know, is the quintessential song. <laughs> it's the quintessential song. You are into Lewis Carroll. I just ripped off Lewis Carroll in yeah, a book that I wrote for kids. We both have that in common. I think it's great. What a wonderful book that was. It is pretty neat. And what a cool song. When you listen to it, do you listen to it? Ever? Well, I hear it occasionally, right. and I get the checks in the mail. So that's, uh, you know, I remember it for that. Right. But it, it was what I had intended for it to be. Uh, it really didn't come out that way. That was a song I was singing at the parents because the books that they read to us, they were, they were bitching about, how come you're taking all these drugs and everything? I mean, why can't you just be like us and get slopped up on alcohol? So what I did was I was trying to remind them that the books that they read to us when we were little, Wizard of Oz, right. uh, which you lie down in a field of opium poppies, and then all of a sudden you see the Emerald City, <laughs> Alice in Wonderland, who takes at least five different drugs, the right. hashish with the mushrooms, with the uh, drink me and get high with the pill. I mean, you know, just it's constant. Yeah. And um, Peter Pan, you sprinkle a little white dust on you and you can fly. So the impression I got was that if you have some chemical or other, right. hey, things get really interesting. And they read that to us. And they, what, what, they weren't listening to what they were reading. Yeah. So they were asking us why we were taking this stuff. Why not? When you think about that time and this time, are there any correlations for young people? I mean, we were young once. We were young then, and now there's young people now. Is there any is there any connection between us? Because lots of people sort of feel like these young people are kind of a world apart from us. Are they really? Do you? Think? I don't know. Because I was talking about my daughter. Uh, she was mentioning when you when I was a kid, and you uh, go over to somebody's house and meet their parents, you're kind of trying to be a certain way right. to either impress or placate the parents. And um, I was hoping that it wasn't that way. Uh, but it's still, there's still a difference in that because uh, for me, it's rock and roll. The kids are afraid they're trying to be real cool. Right. So there is still that difference. You can't help it in age groups of uh, these are the kids and these are the parents. Right. It's not as split as it was when I was a kid mm. uh, or when I was 25, right. um, the difference between my parents and myself. But uh, I was taught at a finishing school how to act uh, <laughs> like I was uh, refined. Were you supposed to be part of the Junior League? I was supposed to do that. Um, I went out with the uh, Princeton boys and did all that kind of stuff. And when I was about 23, uh, a fellow said to me, you have a good mind, but there's nothing in there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> let me tell you a few things. The world is not like Palo Alto, California. Here's how it goes. He handed me the decline and fall of the Roman Empire and we were off. He made me listen to radio stations, he made me read newspapers about what's really gone in, going on. Then I was furious. So I made money being furious or sarcastic. Because I didn't know, I mean, I thought everything was kind of okay and, you know, there weren't any people who did heroin. They all lived in New York and guys who exposed themselves all live in New York and California's fine. I mean, it, 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 you know, it's just this kind of uh, leave it to beaver. Right. Uh, is or how Ozzie, I grew up. Ozzie and Harriet, exactly. who had no daughters. My parents argued you know. less than Ozzie and Harriet. I mean, I'm talking about I had a real, serious, there's no problem here, upbringing. Well, they, they just must have any... flipped right out when you, <laughs> when oh, you uh, went into oh, this other world. I can world. imagine how they, uh, but they were taught, trained not to flip out. So what it was is, Grace, do you really think that you ought to be getting your third drunk driving arrest? And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it was uh, the worst. Like my mom was wonderful pr people, but they were brought up to be this way. Right. And uh, I never hated them for that. I just figured that's the way they are. But the worst, you know, the maddest she'd get was her lips would go like that. There was no yelling in my house ever. There's laughter, but no yelling. You don't scream at anybody. You don't get too boisterous. Very straight Republican upbringing. Really? And I just went, when I was 23, I learned all this other stuff. I just went, nah, I don't think so. Nah. 
That and, is amazing to yeah. me. And to this day, I, ha I really haven't changed, so I'm still an old hippie, I guess, uh, because what we were talking about, uh, the ethics, have not changed. Mm. You're still aiming for that, is acceptance of all people. Um, let's not have war machines. Yeah. Let's try to talk. You know, it's the same stuff. Yeah. And uh, you keep, there was a major thrust at that point, but there may be again. But there's damn many people in the world that young people who still, who feel that way or uh, take up that uh, politic aren't heard. Yeah. Because what we want as a record company or as a movie company right. is something that's like Madonna or like Prince or like Michael Jackson, uh, which is you don't say an awful lot. The most offensive you get is you grab your crotch. Yeah, or bear your tits. Yeah. You know. And I don't mind tit bearing and crotch stuff. Well, if, if you, you got nine, the tits to bear, you know it's okay. Yeah, you got nine records on an album. I want to hear a little bit of tits, a little bit of crotch, and maybe something else. Yeah. Hello? You know. <laughs> well, honey, we're going to come back and hear a little something else with Grace Slick. Go on now. Go ahead. Get all excited here. You have, you have a quote that I, I want to reflect with you on. You can't be sexy over 50. You think that's true? Well, you can sure try. But the thing is, what I was thinking about is that generally, not all, mm. so don't write in, you know, but most, and I'm talking about men, right. uh, do not lie around and daydream, let me put it politely, <laughs> about 50-year-old women. If they have their choice, okay, now Linda Evans looks good and Jane Fonda and whatever, but you choose between Jane Fonda and uh, name one of the young babes, I don't know, 23 year old, some Michelle babe. Yeah, Who? Uh, uh, Michelle, Pfeiffer, Michelle Pfeiffer and Jane Cindy Fonda. Crawford. What do you think they're going to take? Huh? Well, Let's get real. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. I mean, it's real nice to be attractive when you're, but nobody's going bonkers over people who are 50. And that doesn't mean you should roll up and die because there's a stage, I think, in life where you do certain things and you move as gracefully as you can into those stages. And when you are older, hopefully you've learned something and your bit is to be a teacher, I think, Yeah. to a point. Teacher sounds a little bit stiff, but you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, you've yeah. You've got some stuff going on, hopefully if you're still, uh, uh, brains or cells are still working. Well, do you think of yourself as sexy? Not particularly, no. <gasps> Grace, uh -uh. I think you're really sexy. No. The, I, I can pick out parts that I think are okay, but as a unit, um, I think also the lack of naivete is somewhat unsexy. Mm. Mm. The more you learn, the more uh, it's kind of, it's, uh, particularly women are scary. Right, right. And maybe <laughs> that'll be overcome, maybe it won't, I don't know. Well, see, I always, I get into this booty thing, because <laughs> I do, I do, because the fat just... <laughs> accumulates. It didn't used to do that. It used to be I could flit around and be cute. Do anything. You know, but now this fell, this widened, and I'm not 50, but I still think I'm going to be a good looking 50 year old broad. Yeah. You know? Well, you can be a hideous 50 year old, or you can be good looking 50, but all I was saying when I said that to your producer, whoever I was talking to, is that given a choice, mm. I don't think a guy is going to be mooning around over Joan Collins as opposed to right. Michelle Pfeiffer. It ain't gonna happen. Never has, never well, will. What is it with this youth stuff? Because they're built, they're built to reproduce. So there's that animal stuff of reproduction. Ah. You don't reproduce, it's natural. Right. Oh, there's a young, healthy one. That's gonna be able to reproduce. And I don't think guys think of it in that term. Right. They're built to do that. But that scent comes in that musky that, thing. Yeah, and, there, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> everything goes to Well, the, you yeah. saw what happened to him? That's. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but he's a happy guy. He is a happy, and he's asleep. And look at the look on his face. Yes. He's got his best friend with him. See, now this is a subtle kind of thing that the audience is not going to learn about, and you never will either. What, the subtlety of, well, <laughs> maybe they will too. Can we get a close-up of this art piece? <laughs> <laughs> not there in certain no, markets. You're not supposed to be. A, you you cannot discuss the humorous side of penises on this show. No, but you can discuss the medical side, and of that is, here's what you're paying eight to ten billion dollars a year for, 
is experiments like this. This is where I got into biomedical right. stuff. There's a, a currently a man's being paid uh, approximately $150,000, uh, possibly in perpetuity, I'm not sure, but this is per year, for anesthetizing rat penises and then counting the amount of seconds it takes for them to copulate as opposed to a rat whose penis has not been anesthetized. These kinds of experiments, and it's that, the, the rat experiments on sexuality are that thick, has nothing to do with human beings, and we're paying for this. But, it, it, okay, let's, let's, let's take a step back for a second. Let's. A man says, I'd like to take a step I forward. want to play, no, see, because I'm slow, and I know if I'm slow, my, some of my audience is going to be slow, because my question is, what is the outcome? So we find out that rats do the nasty slower when their penises are anesthetized. Is that like going to give us some big, like, cure for cancer, or is this going to, nothing? Just no. Just curiosities. And people say, okay, well, that's unusual, and you're t maybe we should stop those kinds of experiments. Let's talk about, then, the stuff that's heavy duty, like right. the big three, which is diabetes, cancer, and heart disease. Right. For 200 years, and billions and billions of dollars a year, and billions of animals, they've been trying to figure stuff out. And like Ross Perot says, simple. They look different, they are different. I mean, it, it is that simple. Yeah, yeah. We're built differently. You can't even extrapolate from human to human. In other words, you may be able to take Zomax and it'll kill me. Right. Uh, they don't want to spend all the big uh, groups, World Health Organization, National Institute of Health, National Cancer, everybody have said that prevention is way ahead of, of all these medical procedures in making people healthy. Right. But 0.01% of the money that we give, tax right. money, is spent on letting people know how to eat, how to conduct themselves. Right. And that would save everybody's lives. They say, well, what if they found a cure for uh, Lugajnu's disease or something and my daughter died, and what would you tell her if they hadn't been experimenting with animals and they couldn't find it? What do you tell 20 mothers whose children have died yeah. because they didn't get preventative measures? Yeah. That's what I'm aiming at. It's, it's a fancy name. Um, it's allocation of funds. Right. It's where you put this stuff. Where'd your interest in this come from? Because it's a, I, I think for, for most people, because people don't sort of realize that we actually have real lives and we are interested <laughs> in other things, it seems like a long stretch from rock and roll to medical research. Yeah. So take, take me a little bit into how you, you walked into this. Well, I wasn't uh, uh, what they call animal people, animal rights kind of stuff. I didn't know anything about it. Uh, I saw a panda on CNN, and I thought, geez, I'd like to have one of those. That's a cute thing, just kind of off the wall. I wrote to World Wildlife, said, how do I get a panda? And they didn't write back and say, are you ever stupid? You know, is that the dumbest remark I've heard? They're, they wrote back and said, there's only a 1,000 pandas left. Nobody can have them. They're owned by the Chinese government. I thought, why are there only a 1,000 left? So once you're on World Wildlife's mailing list, yeah, you're on People yeah. for Ethical Treatment. And I get all this information about animals, and it all seemed fairly reasonable. Like, don't wear fur because there's no point in it. There's plenty of synthetics that are stronger. You don't want to mess up animals if you don't have to. And all of it sound reasonable, except when they said uh, all modern medical miracles uh, have come about because of animal experiments. And I thought, all is the wrong thing to say to me because mm -hmm. all isn't anything all. Right. The more I look into this stuff, the more kind of... Uh, I can say hideous it gets yeah. in the sense that uh, either from ignorance or from flat out lying, right. we're being jerked around. Well, you're not going to be jerked around no more right this second because we're going to commercial. That, we'll be right back. And who's the sponsor? <laughs> to God knows. Ooh, yes, certain something. Oh, my grace, there's Why? a bag next to me. Why? Why what is that? Hope he has something that's going to be a surprise. I think of us. it's for Grace. This is for who you are, and to say thank you for coming. Because oh. we know that you didn't really get to to have one, so we got you one. <laughs> it's my favorite guy. Yes. It's the panda bear. Look and at that guy. Here's hoping that one day there'll thank be you. more than a thousand. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye. Good night. <laughs> you know, oh, we put this God. on the panda.